Uh, thanks, Jandy, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm relying on technology that you can hear me. Uh, it's a pleasure to um, speak with you today and thank you for giving up some of your time. I hope you're tucking into some sort of nice lunch. Um, the story of Jarawara is well known and it's particularly well known uh, in the Victorian setting. Um, rather than go through all of it, and I'll just do a summary of it, I thought it might be useful, um, particularly from a governance perspective, to see how what I've reflected on uh, nearly two years later. Um, just so you remember, the Jarawara Health Service, uh, as it was and still is, uh, comprises the Bacchus Marsh Rural and Regional Hospital, which is a small, typical, small rural health service with 28 medical surgical beds, a mixed ward, everything from four-year-old tonsils staying overnight to hip replacements to palliative care, uh, drug and alcohol management and um, care of heart failure in the elderly. We have 12 maternity and postnatal beds that are interchangeable, a 30-bed residential aged care facility, a 24-hour urgent care, two operating theatres and a day procedure room. Uh, there's also a huge community health centre at Melton, uh, about to have another one built, finished next door, and community health services on site at Bacchus uh, and Caroline Springs. Of significance to the story was that uh, births had increased from 447 in 2004-05 to over 950 in 2012-13. Um, so without going through all of this, we were classified as a level one maternity service. Uh, we said yes to all of these, but the particular thing to note uh, was that when we said yes, we had an anaesthetist 24 hours a day on call, that was true. Uh, and that there are either GP or specialists, that was true. It also says to be a level three that we need to have a paediatrician or GP with paediatric skills on call as well, uh, and that was true. The problem was in Jerawara's situation, this was the same person. So um, there was a degree of uh, faith, I guess, uh, somehow that these people would be superhuman and could actually look after a deteriorating mother and baby. Uh, I might say their skills uh, throughout of all of this were never questioned and in fact complimented throughout uh, all of the reviews that took place. Um, so as we go forward, um, the model was there was an over, the locally trained specialist who'd worked in the hospital for over 30 years, had an overseas trained specialist come and all her Australian training was done at uh, Jerawara or Bacchus. We had two career medical officers, overseas trained graduates who had trained in obstetrics in another country, uh, and a third career medical officer who had done her dip obs uh, in India, went back, uh, went to Ballarat, did a transcog and came back. Uh, the GP obstetricians had slowly withdrawn from the service. I'm not entirely sure by design or by um, happenstance that uh, the recruitment of staffing uh, obstetricians certainly reduced the need for the local GP obstetricians uh, because up until then it had been a very typical service with uh, very active GP obstetricians uh, as well. There were two consultant anaesthetists, two GP anaesthetists, and everyone was trained in neonatal resuscitation. The doctors were, uh, there was no paediatric service, uh, and there was a over, uh, HMO in urgent care. The K2 fetal assessment program had been purchased, uh, but not fully rolled out, and there was no on-site ultrasound. I think from a governance perspective, this is a really interesting model. This was the committee structure that occurred prior uh, to all the, uh, the troubles, as we call them, in, uh, in 2015. Um, chief executive with enormous influence in relation to what went to the board uh, and uh, a most unusual system here um, that was proved to, to be a problem in terms of the board knowing uh, what was actually going on, and I'll talk about that uh, that shortly. Uh, the board, I might say, met every month, uh, and my understanding had great faith in the chief executive. He had been appointed for 17 years, uh, was highly regarded by the town. Someone said to me he had once saved the health service when he first came from some some sort of financial problems, and was certainly revered within uh, within Bacchus Marsh and within the hospital as doing a a, a terrific job. Um, the internal review is interesting. Uh, they spoke about and wrote about RCAs having been undertaken. Certainly uh, all of these uh, events, and you'll recall there were 11 stillbirths, 
uh, had some form of internal review. They called them RCAs uh, and reported them as RCAs as in to themselves. Uh, but in fact, they were a case discussion which took place between senior maternity, uh, obstetric and sometimes paediatric staff. Uh, it's not off, often with the doctors involved because they were busy um, at the antenatal clinic, uh, 15 minutes away by car in Melton, uh, and were written up with not particularly strong recommendations. Uh, and this was clearly a flaw in the system. Uh, as you will know, a cluster was uh, identified for stillbirths that occurred between January 2013 and really the middle of 2014, and they affected 11 families. Uh, the department became aware of the cluster in April 2015. They were informed by Coppin, the Consultative Committee on Perinatal Morbidity and Mortality. Um, Professor Ewan Wallace undertook a review of the deaths and determined that seven out of the 11 uh, were in fact uh, avoidable. Uh, around about the same time and completely uh, unrelated to this, we had an accreditation survey that took place on the 28th and the 30th of July. Uh, it's important to note that the surveyors had a copy of that uh, um, organisational chart and were also given a copy of the Wallace report. Um, there were changes uh, in the chief executive, an interim chief executive was appointed in August uh, and uh, soon after that a draft ACHS report was received that actually said we had passed uh, and um, it was obvious uh, to the health department after legal advice that uh, we would need to undertake open disclosure with the families involved. This is an executive summary of Professor Wallace's report. It's wonderfully succinct. Um, and I would hope that every single health service in this state uh, and uh, also the country have looked at that to see whether they uh, would uh, be able to comply with the recommendations that Professor Wallace suggested uh, in 2015. We developed an open disclosure action plan and. I, I'm planning to do a, um, a discussion around open disclosure uh, later in the year. Uh, suffice to say, we had to disclose to the staff and to the women. Uh, and once that was taken place um, by the 15th of October, all the women had been spoken to, uh, after which the minister made the public announcement, which she believed was in the public's best interest around this really dreadful failure of clinical governance, the worst she described as having occurred in Victorian history. Uh, the media scrutiny was extraordinary, uh, relentless. Um, whilst we were reeling from that, we also uh, had uh, suggested that ACHS may wish to reconsider passing us, uh, and they re-reviewed all our documentation and came up with 43 not met recommendations to be completed within 90 days. Um, in late October, the Minister sacked the board and Dr. John Ballard was appointed our, as, as our administrator by the minister and remains our administrator to this day. A permanent chief executive, director of medical services and director of nursing were appointed in October, 2015. Toward the end of the year, we had external people sitting on our finance committee and our safety and quality committee. Uh, and we appointed a new director of safety, quality and system improvement. We passed accreditation. Uh, and uh, in March 2016, we were fully accredited. Uh, this was the new committee structure that we took to uh, the board or the administrator in late 2015. Um, it looks pretty busy. If you forget about the committee legend, it looks less busy. Uh, but in essence, it doesn't really matter whether you've got a large hospital or a small hospital. If you have services, surgical services, medical services, pediatric services, maternity, urgent care, uh, they all need to report upwards and questions of concern need to be moved downwards. And so this has been slightly revised, but was very clear around uh, how we would report in terms of activity, actions, outcomes, follow up and review. Uh, babies continue to be born. We go into 2016, there are still problems. And again, more bad publicity. Uh, the other thing of interest, and I'll refer to it slightly, relates to uh, the way APRA investigated our staff. Uh, I appreciate that they have a large job to do, um, but I think it would be a very strong view that they are extraordinarily slow uh, in undertaking these reviews. Um, the senior obstetrician received sanctions in July 2015 
following a report made in February 2013. That's right, 26 months later, uh, the hospital uh, was told that there were concerns about the senior obstetrician's practice. Um, the hospital had waited all of that time, uh, assuming that if there was no problem from APRA, there was no problem. Uh, but in fact, uh, the pace of their review uh, is, was really troubling uh, and remains troubling. As I said, I'm mindful of what they have to do, uh, but it's extraordinarily stressful on the staff, on the hospital, uh, and uh, there's a, an expression uh, that uh, slow justice is bad justice. And I do think uh, they need to uh, speed up a little about what they need to do. Um, the Director of Nursing resigned, the Director of uh, Quality Safety resigned, and they've left the ARPRA workload. Uh, in March uh, 2017, ARPRA saw fit to report to the public uh, in relation to what had happened. There were 96 matters reported. Uh, 40 of those were what's termed their own motion. So on the basis of all the information we had sent, sent to them, uh, they reviewed a total of uh, 40 practitioners. Um, 56 were external notifications uh, by the community. Uh, 18 months since the Prime Minister's conference, and so that's uh, two years late now, um, 17 of those staff still have an outstanding matters and not all of them have been sorted out. So as I said, extremely slow process for them. Um, Bacchus is up and running and has been really since late 2015. We have uh, excellent maternity consultants. We have a paediatric service. Uh, we have new equipment. We're about to open some new refurbished rooms. Uh, we have a centralised CTG system. Uh, we have an excellent working relationship with Sunshine Hospital. I might say that the Women's and Sunshine were remarkable in their kindness to us uh, during those very early days. Uh, and um, we are clear about our capability uh, and the system works well, she says, touching wood. Um, this is a picture of Jerawarra when I first came here. A sad and neglected building and a, a war memorial as I've ever seen. Uh, I hope I've put the lovely new photo of it at the end for you to have a look at. Um, this was a service that was pretty unloved. Uh, it was extraordinarily busy. It was beloved by the community uh, and uh, played a very important role and still plays a very important role in the community. Uh, and there were really 10 things that I learned. Um, the reason for what went on, uh, I have described, and some of you may have heard it as the L phenomenon, um, which is no matter how much you want something to be true, uh, reality is reality. I don't look like Elle McPherson. Self-assessments aren't a reality. What you hope and dream aren't a reality. Uh, that in fact this was an organisation, as I said, proud, beloved by its community. The community had raised funds for this hospital and it in fact came out on a ship from uh, England in 1948. Uh, and it's a War Memorial Hospital. Uh, it has a very important role. And as such, there was a great belief, I think, that they could do not quite everything, but an awful lot. Uh, they saw their patients having to go to Western as being somewhat of a failure. They had to attack the ring road, survive the ring road, find park, find parking, uh, walk around a strange, large, busy hospital. Uh, and really everyone would much rather be looked after at Bacchus. Um, but with that inward looking and a sense of professional isolation from the medical staff, uh, it created an environment where they simply didn't know what they didn't know. Uh, and that they uh, saw that stillbirths and deaths were a natural consequence of a maternity service. And presumably when you had more babies, there would presumably be more deaths. Although I'm absolutely certain none of the medical staff were aware of the significant numbers of those. Uh, interestingly, they weren't reported to the board the board received often 200 pages of information. Every board meeting that was largely unintelligible. Uh, there was a risk review committee that looked at risks and yet obstetrics was not listed as one of their risks. So this was a, an organisation that in the space of less than six years had doubled their numbers of births without a huge number and increase in staff or resources. So I think the reason was simply that uh, they wanted to be all things to their patients. They had a very conservative model of obstetric care and they suffered greatly from professional isolation, even though 
Paradoxically, they're 60k from the centre of Melbourne. There's a lovely hill outside Backus Marsh that's really quite tall. And if you go to the top of it, you can see the city of Melbourne. So they were professionally isolated, not because of geographical reasons, but they didn't have in people coming in. They didn't benchmark with other people. Uh, they were very happy to keep going as they did. Financially, they were doing well. They got plenty of money for babies. They were given some growth funding um, to encourage more babies. And there was even a publication called Towards a Thousand Births, uh, which was really the signature for uh, this really very small health service doing a remarkable number of deliveries. Um, there are 10 things I think I learned and, and I'll go through them uh, and, and very happy to discuss them. Uh, I think these have probably changed. It's now um, two years since the department first heard about this cluster. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's been uh, in the mind of others for many, for many years. But these were the, the, th the, the key things, I think, as a manager and a leader, what, what I learned. Um, the first is that structure um, is everything. Um, knowing who is doing what, where they are doing it. It's very old fashioned safety. It would be seen very much as safety one thinking um, so that uh, we need to be clear on what we do. We need to know that we do it. We need to check that we do it. And then internally there is accountability uh, within the organization. Now we also know that uh, some organizations don't look quite as neatly as this and they look a bit like this. Uh, and there's all sorts of things going on with relevant people being very frustrated. The complex adaptive thinkers would tell us that healthcare is very much an example of a complex adaptive system. This is not actually an example of health, but it is an example of a similar organisation where the size of these uh, circles uh, speak to those who um, affect greatest uh, influence in the organisation. And they may not be the hierarchy that you see here, uh, but they are in fact influential people uh, that control some of the work in terms of what's happening. And um, there's been excellent work by Andrew Johnson in Townsville looking at this with Geoffrey Braithwaite looking at this. And uh, um, so that we need to understand that this structure at least sets us up for what is supposed to happen. Uh, but this is often the reality of a busy complex healthcare system. And we, need to be really mindful of that. Um, process is the key. Um, the Donabedian theory of quality speaks of structure, process and outcome. And you can't expect a good outcome unless your structures and processes are in place. I must say I'm an unabashed Donabedian fan. Um, aside from a misspelling, I'm sorry. Um, we need to be clear if we're running a maternity service that the standard of the service at midday on Monday is the same as the service at midday on Sunday is the same standard as at four o'clock in the morning on Wednesday morning. Um, there are a lot of health services, particularly maternity services, who hope that everything will be okay as opposed to being certain. They go and uh, you should be able to go onto a roster and find your staff know what their skills are, know what their training is uh, every time. Not with a bit of luck, hopefully, or as long as Maureen doesn't take leave, we're going to be okay. Uh, and if you look at any of the diagrams around quality, uh, there's an element around all of this being necessary every day, every way, as we've agreed. Uh, not hoping that nothing happens over the weekend if a senior consultant's away, being honest about what your capability is. We have a policy called transfer of labour care. Uh, we've only had to enact it uh, once last year uh, and we haven't enacted it this year. Again, she says touching wood. So if we don't have the right staff, if we don't have enough midwives or we don't have enough doctors, uh, then we go on effectively obstetric bypass. Um, the patients may come to us, but Sunshine know we go on this system and they realise that for some time they'll, receiving, uh, they'll be receiving patients from us. Uh, as I said, it's about being honest, uh, just like the L phenomenon says, about being honest about what you have and not wishing and hoping and praying um, that it'll be okay. Um, the third thing is uh, evidence being king. Um, 
W. Edwards Deming is the king of Toyota thinking uh, and was one of the old gurus of quality assurance and basically said you can't manage what you can't measure. Uh, and uh, certainly, again, this is slightly old-fashioned thinking. The Americans have gone way beyond all of this. I'm not sure in Victoria we have anything like the data that we need to measure ourselves properly. Uh, we need to be honest about benchmarks. We need to be honest about where our patients sit. Uh, and we need to be very clear that we know whether it's good or bad. Um, the number of stillbirths was never counted in any form of scorecard that went to the board or was seen internally. Uh, and um, certainly the organisation shied away from any form of active measurement. Uh, and going back to the L phenomenon, the only way I've ever been able to lose weight is if I finally get on the scales. Uh, and it tells me the information that I don't want to know, but it also gives me the reality. So rather than saying I'm assuming things are happen or sending out a self-assessment, organisations and departments of health need to be very real about saying what exactly is happening. And I appreciate with 84 health services in Victoria, this is quite difficult, uh, but simply sending out um, self-assessments is creating and I think perpetuating a delusion uh, that may be taking place. Uh, this is just an example of, of a scorecard I did uh, before I came to, to, uh, to Bacchus uh, and we now have one just like this we know what green is, we know what red is, and we know what amber is. Uh, and this is looked at by the board, it's looked at by the Safety and Quality Committee, it's looked at by the organisational managers and leaders, um, so that people know exactly where they are, uh, and we all then need to know what they're doing about trying to resolve some of that. Um, this, uh, as I said, is the way I see myself in the morning, rather than what actually comes uh, on the scales. Very early on, I think we did really very well to maintain a health service, to recruit new staff. Um, we had obviously informed uh, women who had booked in that they could go to Western or to, to Sunshine or to the Royal, Mel uh, to the Royal Women's. Um, and I think we bedded things down really by the first year. Things had settled down remarkably. Um, if it wasn't for being in the paper every so often, things could almost have returned to normal. Um, what we then, of course, had to discover was what to do about an organisation that had let this occur. What was it? What were the root causes uh, around why this organisation got to the stage that it simply didn't notice 11 stillbirths? Uh, and I think it's true to say that there were quite a lot of challenges in the health service in relation to this, and I don't think they're particularly unusual and confined to Bacchus Marsh. Um, and we made a lot of change. Um, Probably we had to change an awful lot and as such uh, we got a bit smart for ourselves uh, and uh, strayed away from uh, a recipe for change. Now there are many models of change, certainly Cotter's change model uh, resonates well with everyone I've ever worked with in healthcare. Um, it speaks about creating a burning platform, creating the urgency to change. It then, and I don't need to go through all of these, goes through uh, creating a climate for change, engaging and enabling the organisation and implementing and sustaining the change. Uh, I think we got a bit clever uh, and went from one to four to six uh, from time to time. And I'm not sure that we spent enough time, as I said, after the first year, informing those coalitions. I think we created urgency, we had a vision. I thought we'd communicated that vision, but our People Matter survey would suggest that we haven't. Um, and so I would certainly say that one of the major lessons for me was that this model really works when you stick to the recipe. You can't cut corners. You need to really um, make sure it, it uh, is the basis and you constantly go back to the formula uh, to make sure that you stay on track. Uh, and as a result, um, the uh, eighth element of Cotter is all around making it stick. This slide looks at um, some of these, his suggestions around overcoming resistance to change. Um, we then, the first bit all sounds fine, but implicit and explicit coercion. Uh, I think we need to be careful how we phrase that in healthcare, uh, but certainly uh, for a number of things we tried to do, we tried to do them more quickly. And I'm not sure that we had really bettered down what needed to happen so that our change would in fact stick. Um, 
trust and relationships are powerful and not easy to change. Um, I found it extraordinary to know that a number of our staff, uh, despite all that had happened, despite the publicity, despite the grief that they were going through with APRA, uh, remained um, friends in a social environment with some of their managers from before. Uh, and I think we can't underestimate in a large town, but one would venture to say, particularly in a small town, uh, those relationships are not easy to change. Uh, to change your trust uh, from a chief executive who has really, as we were told, saved the health service 17 years earlier uh, is not easy. Uh, and those long-standing relationships, many of you may be on boards and you've been with people for a very long time. You've been with your chief executive for a very long time. Uh, and to then uh, be able to appraise them with a critical eye, uh, to be able to seek evidence rather than just my word, uh, to be able to be forever vigilant in relation to your job and their job is extremely difficult. Uh, and I certainly think that um, that's something that uh, one can never underestimate. Uh, we certainly had great support from a lot of the organisations. Uh, but we found as we went through going into year two that some of those relationships and some of those trust issues weren't as, as right as we might have hoped. Uh, and that's something I think I learned very much that even in the midst of what could only be described as utterly dreadful, having the paper on the front page of the paper and television and on radio and um, people in the street weeping and my girl in my local coffee shop just distraught because it was destroying the town. Uh, there remain great loyalties to people who went before and a reluctance to change um, as a result. And I do think that's something that needs to be really, really strongly considered. Um, some of the smart American firms talk about uh, executive walkabouts and it's in fact trademarked. I was taught that if you want to manage a hospital, you have to walk around the hospital. Uh, no differently than if you're a surgeon, you need to look after your post-operative patients. Uh, so the walkabout accountability being seen is really important, particularly for managers and executives. We all have hours and hours and hours of stuff to do in our, in our offices, uh, but it's really important that you're seen. It's really important that you touch and feel and smell the organisation, that people can come up to you, that they can talk to you, that you're not hiding in a room. Uh, and I quite like the be seen, be safe to make sure drivers can see you. I think we need to be, be seen, be safe so staff can see you. Uh, and so staff understand that you're around, that you will hear and see uh, their reality. And uh, in a very large organisation, it does take a lot of planning to do. Um, but uh, it's a very important, I believe, lesson that uh, uh, was certainly reinforced uh, because we did it so much from the start. Uh, we were told in contrast to previous management uh, and that was seen as very reassuring for staff and also uh, demonstrated absolute transparency in what we were trying to do, which was also really important. Um, the value of authenticity can't be underestimated. Um, and whether it's Barack Obama, whom everyone felt was utterly authentic, replaced by Donald Trump, who people may not like, but one would tend to say that you get what you think you're going to get with him, uh, he said he was going to do various things before he became president and he's done all of those things. He said he's not an insider. He's going to bend the rules. He's going to drain the swamp. Uh, and one would suggest that a number of people like him because he seems to be authentic. Um, Mrs Thatcher was similarly seen as authentic. A lot of people didn't like her and she was ultimately voted out of office by her peers, in fact. Um, but people would say, you mightn't like her, but you know where you stand. And that level of authenticity, I think, is really important if you want to bring a staff with you. Uh, we look at our contemporary politicians and some would say that Malcolm, Ta Malcolm, Malcolm Turnbull has betrayed his uh, previously left-wing views around the Republic by meeting and bowing with the Queen and is he as authentic as he used to be, as he seems to be much more right-wing than many remember him 20 years ago. Uh, polls continue to suggest that regardless of what Bill Shorten is now, there is a sense that um, he's not necessarily authentic. It's all about winning. And he may change horses uh, mid-race uh, mid 
to make sure he's on the winning horse. And then you have people like Gillian Triggs and Peter Cosgrove, for whom authenticity is absolute. Um, as the Human Rights Commissioner, Professor Triggs wore a great deal of frack from the government. Uh, and when you, if you have the chance to hear her speak, and I have, you are struck by her absolute authenticity. And someone like Peter Cosgrove, who many of us would have heard yesterday at Anzac Day, similarly, completely authentic. So if you are in a position to manage and lead an organisation, um, you need to walk the walk and talk the talk as authentically as you can. I think once staff or people think you're double dealing or going behind the scenes or being disingenuous, uh, then that's when people lose you. And it may well be that you put a proposal to the health department and they say no, which they may for many, many very valid reasons. Then I think you let the community know that that's what you've done and you do it honestly. You don't do it disingenuously. Uh, and I think that that commitment to being authentic is, is a really important lesson. Well, something I knew but was importantly reinforced through my experience at Jerawara. Um, you would think that putting the patient first uh, is what we do. It's not always a given. There were certainly elements uh, at Jerawara where it appeared to be somewhat more staff focused than patient focused. Uh, they were very busy, they were moving patients through, um, but one got a sense that their patient centred care was a little bit more like this. Uh, there are concerns and were concerns when GPs started to do consultations in their rooms and sat at 90 degrees to their patients so they could type, some of the intimacy of a patient consultation with your GP was lost. Uh, with the onset of electronic medical records, we're probably moving the same way in hospital. Uh, and I think it's really important that the patient needed to, needs to be put first. Uh, don't assume that it happens in your organisation, uh, just because there might be a patient-centred committee or whatever it might be, read those complaints walk through the wards, see how patients are treated. You can get a sense very clearly whether people are attendant to patients' buzzers or they're simply congregating, chit-chatting and doing the busyness of, of healthcare. Um, the, the patient has to be first. I was fortunate to be trained at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne and the very first lecture we got as a medical student, which I'm pleased to say is still given to the medical students, is that ours is a culture of service. Uh, and that needs to go through from the smallest rural hospital to the largest quaternary hospital we have in the state. Uh, and that's a really important message and one I think particularly for board members don't assume that that takes place. And the place to look for that is really the information you get about complaints, the sorts of complaints, how they're handled, who handles them, is a very good insight into whether or not your organisation puts the patient first. Uh, and that's a little bit of what we now see, really, where the, the clinician is very clear and close to the screen, but not really uh, engaging appropriately with, uh, with their patient. And lastly, um, the absolute essentialness of external review. And I don't really mind whether you're the Melbourne, St Vincent's, the Alfred, Barwon Health, uh, Geelong Hospital, whether you're at Benalla or West Gippsland in Warrigal or at Jerawara, you have to have external eyes come and see what you are doing. Um, from, a, from a housekeeping situation, uh, you notice a cobweb at, at work and you come home and all of a sudden you see that your house is full of cobwebs. You've not noticed them until now. Uh, and for some reason you buy a red car and all of a sudden you see a whole lot of red cars. We are very good at adapting to our current situation. There's a lot of anthropological evidence that we do. But with that comes blindness to our reality. Uh, and there's also a lot of evidence that we sometimes make the facts fit the picture that we want them to fit. Uh, I reviewed some cases, not at Bacchus. Uh, in fact, I reviewed three over the last month or so. They're all related to uh, a post patient with a post-operative problem. Two had stayed in hospital, one had come back. Uh, and the prevailing thought from the surgical team was anything other than the patient was bleeding, that their tachycarda was due to something else. Did they have a pheochromocytoma? Was some bizarre system happening in place? Did they have malignant hypertension? All sorts of rare and obscure diagnoses were thrown around. 
when the reality would simply be that common things occur commonly. And if you've had your bowel open uh, and people have been manhandling it and they've been cutting and diathermy, uh, despite everything that looked good when you left, you might want to have a little look and see whether they're bleeding. And of course, all three of them were bleeding. So we need external eyes to look at what we do. We need that excellent tick, not from my red pen, but from the red pen of somebody I know. Appreciate with 84 Health Services, this is difficult to do. And I know Safer Care Victoria is doing a lot of work around making sure that there are experts attending certainly maternity M&Ms, and I know that that's expanding for surgical anaesthetic M&Ms. I would be very concerned as a board if uh, I had a hospital where none of my committees uh, were visited by an external person at least two monthly. It's really important. We need to find budget for people to come and do it. Uh, most uh, specialists will do it out of the goodness of their heart, but it often sweetens the deal if you can pay them a couple of hundred dollars uh, uh, for their time and, and appreciate their time. Um, but this is really important. Um, surgical review is no different to anaesthetic review or maternity review, review of mental health services or how we run our community health centre. Uh, we get blind to what we do. And uh, it's really important, I think, uh, as I said, for all services. And tertiary hospitals are no different. Uh, in fact, as we know, they do adverse events better than anybody else. So it's not a protection against terrible things happening. But we need the humility and we need the, the humility of our clinicians and the leadership of our clinicians to welcome someone coming in. For those of you who are clinicians, then you do need, I believe, to give some time to, to health services to assist them in what's going on. Um, because if you decide to go home tonight and have a look, I guarantee you'll find cobwebs. Uh, and if you're driving a red car, you'll certainly see several of them on the way home. Uh, I think I've just done 40 minutes um, and I'm very happy to take any questions or comments. Um, I'm hoping that um, they will somehow come through uh, to me now. So, Liz, we do have one question from Mari Aitken. If you um, open up the Q&A. Sure. So, the question is, our board is trying to do some uh, walkabouts too. Do you have any suggestions about how this should happen in a useful way or if the board should even be doing any form of walkabout? So, um, thanks uh, for that question. Um, I think boards need to be very clear on what their role is. They have been appointed by the Minister to act in her stead uh, to um, make sure the health service is running appropriately. How on earth can you do that if you don't go into the health service? Uh, and I don't mean interfere operationally. Um, you should be able to go to the wards. You should be able to, obviously, with people and being mindful of confidentiality. Um, but you can't ask a board to manage something if they don't know anything about it. Uh, and so I think one of the early things that needs to happen to new board members is that they go to various hospitals. Uh, if there are multiple sites, they do a walk around, they speak to the staff. Uh, this is not an inquisition. This is not a fact finding tool behind chief executives back. It's helping them understand what the organization is. Uh, I'm very strong and I know when we were at West Gibson, I was at West Gippsland. Uh, we I had a number of consumers, but we also had board members on a number of committees. So they were on the Consumer Engagement Committee. They were on the Safety and Quality Committee. Uh, and um, they were taking a very active interest. It wasn't just what board member, it was for. So they saw their role as ha helping them understand. And in fact, uh, when the Clinical Governance Committee took place, four board members at attended so that if one or two couldn't attend, they still understood. But they also felt that it was a really important committee for board members to attend so that they understood the business of the health service. You know, a finance and audit committee or a risk and audit committee is really going to be the same sort of thing regardless of the organisation you work in. But the clinical governance committee is really the business committee of the health service. And I would strongly advise that you wander around, uh, that you do it politely and don't just barge into places. Um, but if the minister is asking you to manage a health service, then you need to know and understand the health service if you're going to manage it properly. Uh, next question. 
Uh, what level of maternity do, do we operate now at Jirrawarra? Um, we uh, are still a level three, but we're a real level three. We have 24-hour anaesthetic cover. We have 24-hour paediatric cover. We, in fact, have paediatric consultants who sleep on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, uh, we currently are delivering about 400 babies a year uh, and have capacity to do more than that. Um, some of that was obviously in result, as a result of the publicity and what had happened. Um, about a third of all of our patients who come to antenatal clinic uh, are transferred to Sunshine for obstetric reasons. So we're very uh, clear about what our capability is and we will transfer people as appropriate. Uh, we have what's called an amber meeting. So we have red and green. Uh, but for those women who fall into amber, everyone is reviewed at 36 weeks and then there's a weekly plan for those women to see whether it's still appropriate for them to uh, birth with us or whether they should be transferred to Sunshine. Um, how is the trust of the public regained? Um, we've not done specific focus groups of young women in the health service, uh, in the community. Um, we certainly see bookings in, those, in the first two years, whenever there was a flurry of publicity, our bookings dropped again. Um, I think that we certainly survey all of our current women. Um, as you can imagine, you know, someone burps out of line and we review it. So there's been a culture of pretty uh, enthusiastic reviewing of our outcomes and our processes. I think it's going to take time. Uh, and I think it's probably going to take a number of women who've had a baby whose child's gone to kinder that they talk to mums at kinder uh, about having a baby at Bacchus. I think it's probably a five-year plan um, for us to, to get that confidence back. Um, but we have very happy mothers and partners and families coming through every day. So we're very proud about that. Um, next question, how often should boards expect to carry out tours of small regional health services? Well, the question is very straightforward. If you're managing the service, you need to know about the service. Uh, and that may, may mean it's geographically challenging, um, but uh, that's no reason why you don't do it properly. Um, you know, particularly, uh, well, it doesn't matter whether you're in West Australia or Queensland or New South Wales, they have huge tyrannies of distance uh, and they may not be seen every week or every month, but certainly uh, their district general managers or the various uh, directors there uh, in good health service will have an obligation to actually see what's going on. I mean, if nothing else, Jarawara tells you that you can fudge even an ACHS survey. I've never seen more beautiful folders. I've never seen more um, tabulated paperwork. Um, but it wasn't real. Uh, it wasn't fake. Um, but the truth of it was hidden behind a degree of gloss and glamour uh, that um, is simply not good enough. Uh, and as board members and people interested in governance, you just need to simply ask uh, who staffs our maternity service? What level of training do they have? What are the competencies? Are they all trained in neonatal resuscitation? Have they all done a course of obstetric emergency? Do they practice for emergencies if they're a small service without a number of uh, deliveries every week to keep you up to date? You know, the large tertiary hospitals have it not really easy, but they don't need to practice managing a code blue because they have them so often. Um, the women's don't need to manage practicing managing a cord prolapse because they have them most often. But as you get further from the center of town and away from regional hospitals, small rural hospitals, that are the bulk of Victorian hospitals particularly, uh, don't have many of these. And consequently, when they have them, it's not, it's not rote, it's not easy. They need to remember it. And as a result, simulation and practicing and programs are really essential. Uh, and as board members, you need to ask, how often do we simulate things? And that doesn't matter whether you're a clinician on a board or you're running the local bakery. Uh, one assumes that if you're running the local bakery, there is a plan for if there are no currents or whether all the machines go or those sorts of things. So business continuity is what's called in the rest of the world. Uh, I'm not sure we do this well enough in healthcare. Um, identifying uh, significant risks, which is if we had three women arrive and we have one midwife on staff, what do we do? These are very straightforward, reasonable risk management strategies that I think people ought to be able to do. Um, another question. 
Um, can you please say more about external experts visiting hospital committees? Should this include gov governance committees? Uh, so um, this doesn't include the board, although boards need to do a form of evaluation to see whether they're doing what they need to do. Uh, anything in relation to a clinical committee, we would seek to have an expert and we have almost all of ours covered now. Uh, we have an expert on our finance committee uh, because we don't have a board, um, but I think it's absolutely essential. The anaesthetic committee ought to have a visiting anaesthetist. The periop committee could have a visiting manager from another health service managing the operating theatre. Um, the dental committee needs to have a dentist from somewhere else. Uh, otherwise, you just get caught in your own, uh, your own reality. Um, what FCEP level is required for GP OBS and midwives? So we have a rule, uh, all doctors who work in birth suite have to be FCEP level three. Uh, so FCEP is the Fetal Surveillance Evaluation Program run by the College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology. Uh, they've increased their courses uh, and I've certainly had vigorous discussion with people as to whether it's a fair use of the FCEP certification. Uh, I can tell you, talking to someone uh, uh, with a terrible adverse event, as many of these women did, and explaining that the nursing staff weren't trained in CTG, reading and interpretation is a very, very difficult conversation to have. I would far prefer to say that uh, our staff were all at FCEF level three and, uh, uh, and still something awful might have happened, but at least I know, and the staff member knows they've done their level best to be as well trained as they could. Uh, so to be, so all our doctors have to be, we in fact employed uh, an obstetrician and gynecologist um, a little while ago uh, and she had just done her FCEF and she hadn't um, got the result. And when she did, she was at level two uh, she had to sit it again a month later interstate, did some study and was at FCEP level three for her to go on call. So we decided very early on that that's the standard for the women's and sunshine. Why would our women have any less of a standard? Uh, and it's no different to nursing staff in theatre having adult cardiac life support. Um, just because it's difficult to arrange and just because people work part time, I don't believe you can speak and serve your community if you give them a lesser standard of care. Um, we don't have any GP obstetricians, but if they were uh, to come and work for us, then they would have to be FCEP level three to deliver babies in, uh, in our hospital. Uh, midwives have to be FCEP level three to be in charge, and there's a minimum of two midwives on every ship who are FCEP level three. Uh, and I would think we're at least 90% of our midwives who work in birth suite uh, are at FCEP level three for the midwives. So we pay for it, we get the results uh, and it's done annually. And we've seen that as an absolute commitment to the community and to our staff. Um, next question, where are the board members drawn from and what qualifications do they need to have? Uh, well, we still don't have a board. Uh, and so board members typically will go through um, an evaluation process for their skill mix there clearly needs to be expertise in knowing how hospitals run. Uh, clinical decision-making, uh, there are experts in audit, uh, human resources, accounting, uh, legal issues, um, managing larger organisations. So ex um, headmasters of high schools are often excellent board members. Uh, and there's a template that certainly in Victoria and all the other states do in terms of what ought to be part of a good board. Um, so it speaks to um, a mix of skills, it speaks to a mix of backgrounds, it speaks to diversity, not simply in relation to gender, it relates to age, sexual preference, uh, employment history, uh, as well as their skills as being, uh, as being important. Liz, we've just had a question come through from Deb Miller through the chat function. How do you manage executive opposition to board chair rounding? Um, there's probably a quick answer and a thoughtful answer. Um, boards need to realise they are appointed by the minister to act in her stead to oversee the organisation. How can you oversee an organisation if you don't physically see it? Uh, and I would be very concerned if the chief executive was obstructive to that extent. Now, I don't mean board members popping up at seven o'clock at nursing handover or popping out of the cupboard to check what the cleaners are doing or being uh, busybodies and being um, interfering with the hospital. 
Um, but it would be my view that before all board meetings, board members ought to be able to wander through the hospital uh, and just have a look at what's going on and chat to some staff. I don't see that as a problem. Chief executives may find that a problem, and I understand that, but we live in a world of open disclosure and transparency. Uh, and I would find it very troubling if a chief executive refused for boards to walk around. Um, I'm just mindful it's 2.03. Oh no, we've got a little bit more time. Um, is there any reliance on medical clinicians from agencies? No, we have, uh, um, we, uh, have one of our registrars who's one of the doctors who was there from the very beginning, still works with us and she's going on long service leave. So we'll source a locum for her. Uh, but every, when everyone is at work, we have no locums. Um, we have four consultants, two of whom are part-time. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, one registrar. We get a registrar from Western three days a week, uh, but depending on their availability, we don't always get them. Uh, and as I said, our on-call paediatrics is drawn from our pediatric, our own paediatric service that has two registrars and a fellow, uh, and we have uh, overnight cover with uh, consultant um, paediatricians on site. Um, we have um, a number of long-term anaesthetists, both GP anaesthetists and specialist anaesthetists. Uh, and from time to time, we may need to fill a gap with, with someone, uh, but not usually. Uh, our urgent care used to be almost totally, at Melton, totally run by locums. We got that down to zero, but I see it's up to about 15% with a couple of sick leaves. Uh, and our urgent care at, uh, at Melton, at uh, Bacchus, similarly, was at 100% staffed, but... Um, we've had a couple of resignations, so we've used a few more locums then, but pretty much touch wood, we have a, a nice stable, uh, uh, I think a pretty engaged and terrific medical workforce. So I, it being almost two o'clock, um, I'm, I'm sure people have to dash to two o'clock meetings. Um, I couldn't see your faces, but I, I feel as though I know you a little from the questions and the chats you were sending in. Uh, it's my great pleasure to share my thoughts with you. Uh, the other thing to remember is you don't need to live through a disaster to learn from it. Um, just read the paper, see what happens in other states, in other places, and ask yourself, could it happen to us? It's a really, really, really good risk management exercise to do, and I would suggest you go through some of the disasters uh, that have been in the paper for the last two years as a, a board activity with the executive to, to check, because you don't want to live through one of these if you don't have to. Have a very good afternoon. Pleasure talking to you. Cheerio. Bye.